evening and happy holiday to everybody. So with that being said, um, you had the minutes approved, but we didn't meet last time. So do we need to approve anything, Christina? We need to approve the minutes from August because we okay. weren't able to approve them at the last one. Okay, so the August minutes were printed in your materials. Um, and I would entertain a motion to accept those as presented um, and uh, open it up. I have right. one question. Uh, I am listed as present and absent, which is not uncommon, and I believe in parallel universes, but we have to pick one. It was a Schrodinger's box sort of thing. Um, yeah. So I my just, apologies. I just figured he was bipolar or something like that. Well, it's... But... <laughs> Also, also uh, an, an addition on that is it listed me as absent, but then on section two, it said I approved, uh, I made a motion to approve the minutes. Yeah, you. that was one that we mentioned and I forgot to change that from last time. I will get that changed. Okay, so then I would entertain a motion with the amendments to the minutes as noted in our discussion and reopen it. I shall move. Second. Okay, all those in Second. favor. Yep. Aye. In, aye. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Okay. Aye. aye. Great. Uh, Christina, board vacancies applications. So we still have our uh, mental health practitioner position open. Um, I did send an application um, to Carrie Bond with um, Comprehensive Burrell, whoever, whatever we want to call them now, um, and I have not heard back. Um, we are continuing to go out and offer it to anyone who has any interest, um, or even if they don't have interest, um, we are continuing to try to fill that position, but that is still the one position we have open. Can I ask a question? I noticed on the news the other night that Children's Mercy, I guess, has gotten funding for psychological services they're putting into different offices. And considering Mercy has an office here on 40 Highway by Lowe's, is, is that another uh, source to possibly uh, reach out to them and see if they have somebody that could join? Oh, I We can definitely try. I don't know anyone there who is a mental health practitioner. Um, I don't think my staff, Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, we don't, ha uh, we haven't interacted with someone on the mental health side, but we can always reach out to some of our other contacts and ask if they have a recommendation. Any more discussion on this item? Christina, it, it's been hard. It's been a, it's been a struggle to find somebody, but we'll keep at it. So uh, with that, discussion on opioid settlement funds. Can you give us some backgrounds on, background on this, Christina? Yes. So. Um... As many of you, I'm sure, probably know, there have been several very high profile uh, cases moving through the courts uh, regarding opioids. The city had joined several class action lawsuits um, along with the county, the state, many other municipalities to file against um, multiple groups. I know one of them, I believe, currently is in the Supreme Court the, the, to fight the decision and the settlement. Um, but there was a request from Council Member Dr. McCandless for the Advisory Board of Health to make a recommendation regarding how the city should use our opioid settlement funds going forward. The amount currently expected is in the $1.4 million range. Now, when that money will come, depends on when you know the courts are done doing whatever they need to do um but right now we're looking at 1.4 million dollars and there's specific uses for
for those dollars. They they have to be used certain ways. <clears throat> I know the state um, has publicly stated that they plan on using some of their opioid settlement funds for medication assisted therapy. That's one of the options. I sent the full list of approved uses um, as an attachment for these meetings. Um, one of the other uses, um, and I will admit to being biased, is for the ARCH program for essentially outreach. Um, you know, we can use funds for educational campaigns. We can use funds. There's lots of things we can use funds for. We have to make a decision at some point um, how to use those funds. And the council would like that decision when it's made to be informed by the Advisory Board of Health. So I'll shut up and allow you guys to discuss how you would like to handle that. Are there... When do they want an answer by? Well, they did not give me a timeline. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I know that we had briefly discussed the idea of possibly you guys forming a, you know, a subcommittee, whether you guys wanted to take time and discuss it and then maybe get back together in February with a recommendation. I mean, the dollars are not going to arrive by the end of the year. The city does not need a decision by January 1 about these funds. However, some of these funds are going to start rolling in very soon. Um, and the city would like to know what direction they should go. Christina, Jason here. Uh, I, I, that's a, a significant amount in my book, but a buck and a quarter is a hell of a lot of money in my pocket. Um, so this is a, a neat opportunity. Do we do we know the sort of some of the nature of the problem in independence? Uh, I, I mean, I, I get. I get it. It's huge and fentanyl, and uh, but I guess I don't know. Is there any demographics that help us think about it? Is this affecting one age group, one sort of poor town, one particular group? Or I guess I is there any sort of background data uh, to explain the the problem of uh, as we go into this? So I may lean on Lauren Campbell in just a moment. So Lauren, get ready. Um, the biggest problem we have is that most of our data is old. Um, it is old. It takes a while for the state to get to us. Um, we know it's a problem. What's but, old, Christina? Uh, two years. Okay. We know the situation has been growing worse all across the state. Um, independence has not been hit nearly as hard as St. Louis, but the Kansas City region has a problem. Um, Lauren, do you want to chime in with more? I know she has numbers and some of a lot of them are suppressed. So I'm trying to pull up those numbers. Give me one second. I have to find that spreadsheet. You know, if you if you had the opportunity to sit down and, and look at the exhibit E that you sent sent us, it's about 15 pages. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to make this work. I mean, it talks about funding anybody and everything. You know, it you can fund putting two vials of naloxone in everybody's pocket that walks down the street. Uh, you know, I know there are houses of worship that don't have naloxone. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm working with a church in Raytown, and and uh, I actually had somebody come up to me. We we uh, have a dinner church on Wednesday and and have meals with people that many of whom are unhoused. And she came up and was obviously high on something and had a baggie in her hand and wanted to give me a, a vial of fentanyl so we could sell that and buy more food for people. So she put the vial of fentanyl in my hand. Of course, my first thought was, what am I going to do with the vial of fentanyl and who do I give this to to get rid of it? But interestingly enough, it was actually a vial of naloxone and that she gave me. Um, so I see a lot of it. Uh, I would say every Wednesday night, I see at least 
one or two people that are probably opiate dependent. Uh, and that's out of 300. And of course, that's in Raytown, which is miles away. <laughs> it, it's feet away from independence. So uh, this gives us lots of latitude. You can uh, train daycare people. You can train first responders. You can go into OB doctor's offices and see where they are. You can hire peer, uh, uh, peer support people. Uh, so it pretty much if you can think of somebody that might benefit from money, uh, you can plug them into this without too much work. Yes, Christina. Uh, yes. Uh, I was just I was just gonna say, don't we have a grant now to um, not naloxone uh, for anybody who really needs it? Yes, we do. So right now, yes, we work with MIMH and they provide us all the Narcan we want. Um, we try to give it out to independence residents. However, we have never been um, picky or choosy if there's somebody who comes or if we're at, at an event and there's someone who's from Blue Springs or Raytown or Kansas City and they want Narcan, we're going to give them a box of Narcan. Um, Jackson County also um, has Narcan through the same, the same group. So the good news is right now, we don't have to worry about spending money on Narcan and our first responders. There's a separate grant through essentially the same system that is providing them with um, Narcan. So I know they have it because we've had to, we've given away enough where occasionally we have to run across the street to PD and borrow some of their Narcan until our next shipment can come in so we can keep giving it away. So we know that Independence is very fortunate to be able to have that and give it out. Uh, this is Legler, but kind of amplifying an earlier comment or question, rather than just starting over and trying to reinvent the best way to do it, is there any data or studies of other communities, whether in Missouri or other states, that have demonstrated an impact on reducing opioid dependence in their community with certain interventions or basically is it just exploded everywhere and nobody at this point in the U.S. has a handle on it? Well, I know that it has exploded everywhere. Um, I, I'm sure that there are some good examples from other jurisdictions. Um, I mean, Arch was based on one of those examples. Um, and I can say that some of the reports I have from just the last six months of six months of Arch has shown that they have reduced um, the number of, I guess you could say return visits from from those who were frequently calling 911 or frequently in the system. They've reduced that number by getting those people funneled into uh, crisis centers and, you know, getting them help, um, whether it's, you know, going to rehab or whether it's getting set up with a psychi psychiatrist or a psychologist, they've been able to make real impacts with some of those individuals by spending that extra time um, and not just having them, you know, have a response from fire or PD. That's a, that's a one, you know, a, a very short response that takes care of their immediate problem and then moves them on. Um, so they've had a lot of experience, but I don't, I can't tell you that I've gone and done a ton of research on what has worked because to my knowledge and anyone who wants to correct me, please tell me there's not, there's not been a lot of success. This is Terry Morris again on uh, one of the other directions you can take this is on uh, B1 and uh, four. it actually talks about working um, to help people in transition and treatment and recovery, which can include housing, transportation, education, job placement. And the city currently has a task force that's working on the unhoused population and, and how to deal with that. And so that's also money that can be channeled along 
those supportive services, and I know they are always hurting for cash. So that's another another place we could look. Because uh, the problem with people in recovery is once someone becomes aware that you're in recovery, all of a sudden there's no housing available, there's no jobs available. Uh, and it, so those organizations that are working to help with those needs uh, could benefit from that, those dollars as well. So like I said, lots of opportunities. So Christina, this feels like it's a like for further study kind of thing that we need a smaller group, subgroup of folks to take a look at this, to make a recommendation to this group before we would make any recommendation to the full council. So um, it feels like we need to have representation of the city staff person at least sitting there um, because you're, they're going to have the data, but that we need some other folks to look at this and uh, make some recommendations to the larger group. If, if that is uh, something everyone else thinks is a, is a viable way to pursue this. Well, I second the idea of set, setting up a subcommittee to do that. So with that, I would entertain some folks who might want to participate in that and and uh, I'll I'll just open it up for that. So, Christina, I would I would look to you to make a recommendation for city staff, whether that's you or some a member of your staff, and then a couple folks through. I, I don't know how many people need to be a part of this from this group, but um, I, I think that's the the route we should go. I would recommend at least. Uh, maybe three, four individuals. Um, okay. I think any more than that, we essentially have a quorum and we're the full group again. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, if, if there were three individuals who wanted to make a recommendation to then come back to the group, I think that would be ideal. And I can always pull, um, Lauren, Lauren loves it when I volunteer her for things. Um, I'm sure Lauren and I would both be happy to work on this and to pull some of those evidence-based uh, practices. I'm sure, honestly, the list that we have that they're recommending recommending are those evidence-based practices, but we can see which ones maybe would be more suitable what we would possibly be able to do for a municipality. Jason will Sorry. volunteer, but not to lead. I, I, <laughs> I don't have time to, to take point, but I, if if and if you get three other people, I'm happy to be number four and say thank you for offering and bow out. Any others? So before I uh, do a random number generator and start uh, <laughs> selecting folks, <laughs> John, I'd be I'd be happy to help out. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I'd be willing to help out too. This is Peter Mulliman. Um, okay. But um, as long as, uh, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Okay, that's great. Christina, I think we've got our, we've got our folks. So, hey, thank you Wonderful. folks very much. So with that, next item on the agenda has a, uh, a discussion of communicable diseases. Christina? Well, I'm actually going to open this up to Lauren. Um, she's pulled numbers for the year. I know just right offhand, we can talk about, you know, good old COVID, flu, RSV, everything is, and I'm sure she's going to talk about tick-borne diseases are still hanging around. Lauren? If I can unmute, there we go. All right, so for this year so far, um, first two up are animal bites. We've seen about 213 animal bites so far this year. Um, did have one specimen positive for rabies, but there was no bite involved with that. Um, for STIs, we're at 256 cases so far this year. Um, that's gonna include HIV, syphilis, uh, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. For our enteric diseases, the main one we've seen is campy. We saw 29 of those. They peaked in September and they've been slowing down since then. Um, after that, salmonella was the second most common. We saw 13 cases. A couple of those were actually bacteremia cases, not um, 
like foodborne ones. Um, outside of that, we saw some crypto, Giardia, Cyclo, um, E. coli, and Shigella. We are still seeing tick-borne cases. We had two cases in November. Um, we've been seeing ehrlichiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever this year. For respiratory diseases, we've had 31 TB cases. That's latent and active combined because um, they're suppressed if I do them separately. Um, influenza has started picking up this last week. So far this season, we've seen 32 cases of influenza A and six of influenza B. We've also seen um, some Legionella cases. Those have been spread out throughout the year, um, about one a month. And then for we've had a lot of bacteremia cases this year, mainly strep pneumo with 24 and then Haemophilus influenzae with 11 cases. Um, group A invasive strep is not actually a reportable disease, but we have seen 42 of those cases so far this year. Um, which is uh, more than we saw last year. They mainly peaked in January, but they're starting to go back up again these last two months. And then our COVID was down for a little bit, and we are now up to a case rate of about uh, 96 per 100,000 residents for the last two weeks. So that's my little overview. On on the COVID, uh, is there a certain uh, popula or a certain age uh, group that, uh, or is it, like elderly primarily that's being hit? It's been elderly primarily. Um, most of the nursing homes have been having outbreaks, so that's where a decent amount of the cases have been coming from. I do have a question. When you say we've seen, are you referring to things that are reported back to you by the state or things that are reported to you by the hospital in town or where's that data coming from? So it's it's both. Um, any doctor's office, lab or hospital that's in independence um, is required to report it to either the health department or state. Most of them choose to report to us. So most of my cases come directly from doctor's offices and Centerpoint reports all of their cases to us, and then some of them that come from the hospitals outside of Independence go through those other health departments. Um, the majority of them come from um, the other health departments in the area, and then a few of them come back from state. Okay, thank you. The COVIDs that you're uh, receiving reports, are they covered by that new vaccine or is it a different strain? So I don't know what strain each test is. I just kind of get a positive or a negative at this point. Um, we knew more about, or I was given more data about the strains earlier on. Um, so I'm not sure. On these reports in relation to other areas of the state or the state as a whole, are we in line with what others are seeing? Are we seeing more cases of any of these diseases? Um, do you have do you have insight into that? We've been in line with the surrounding areas um, for the most part. There was a point in time where at least our COVID and then Group A strep were higher than the rest of the surrounding areas, but we've gone back to being about the same as everyone else. I know we have less Giardia than um, Kansas City. Kansas City was having a pretty big outbreak of that, and we only saw a few cases. Okay, Christina, that is our agenda for this evening. Do you want to remind everybody of our next meeting date and uh, hope everyone can join us? You always put me on the spot. I don't know. Well, you the, know, that's, the what I, that's kind of what I'm responsible for. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, so it looks like February 1st is our next meeting. Um, I will separately get um, with... Uh, the subcommittee members and we will try to figure out good dates and times um, for the group to meet. So I will do that, but otherwise I will try to see everybody back February, February 1st at 6 p.m. Great. Okay. Well, see you then. thanks for everyone's time and, and uh, the happy holidays and, and spend time with your family. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.
you need emotion.